Hello everyone, my name is Clancy's and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. Well, without further ado, guys, let's get into today's story and it is the case of Cedric Marke, another South Africa's worst serial killer. He's also known as the Wemmer Park serial killer. So Cedric Marke was born on the 10th of September 1963 making him a Virgo. So there is very limited information about Cedric Marquez because he refused to talk about his background or his past or upbringing. However, I did find a piece of information about him that he volunteered to the police and now and again. So one of the things that Cedric Marquez was free to talk about was the passing of his father when he was about 15 or 16 years old. At that time, he was in the 10th grade. Now, 10th grade, back in the day, used to be the senior or metric of the Bantu education era. So, Bantu education is basically an education system that was designed for black people by the apartheid government. So, basically, it was substandard to the education that was offered to the white kids of South Africa. So, basically, the entire system was designed so that a black child when they finish school they do not proceed to university and study to become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant that sort of stuff but instead they ought to become like manual laborers and cheap laborers for that matter so when you go to grade 10 that would be the black child's school leaving basically and you could actually do whatever you wanted to do. Some black people would go and do nursing, others will go and do plumbing, others will go and do gardening, others will do um, mechanic, basically fixing broken cars, that sort of stuff. These, you, as you can tell, these are not jobs that were meant to give black people dignity, but more like be laborers. And if they become laborers, cheap laborers. However, some black students did go as far as senior year or metric where they proceeded to go to university to study. Mostly it was law and they actually did become lawyers. There were actually other universities that enrolled black students such as the University of the Witwatersrand or Witz University. And I think there was also a university that was solely built for black students. One of them is the University of Zululand in KwaZulu Natal. I think I stand to be corrected. Forte University was one of those black universities that were only meant for black students. Nelson Mandela did go to Forte as well as Witz University and he became a lawyer. So I guess it depended on a student how far they wanted to go with their education. Either they stop at 10th grade or they proceed to matric and then go beyond okay guys another thing that i want to say i'm not feeling really well today so sometimes my energy levels may drop because my throat right now is kind of like itchy i did test and i'm negative for that thing as you know i think maybe it's the change of season because we just moved into summer here in south africa so maybe my body is just trying to adjust to the season i'm not sure so please do bear with me with this one so after Cedric Marquez's father died, he was forced to drop out of school. However, another thing that he recalls when he told the police about his past that kind of changed his life was the fact that when he was 12 years old, he was sent out to the mountain as a rite of passage for a boy to a man. He was basically left in the mountains in the bushes for three months all by himself without food or water. He said that this was barbaric and he did not understand and what human being would do such a thing to a child. So in South Africa, there are different cultures and some of the cultures do send out their boy kids to the mountains for rite of passage from a boy to a man. And they stay there for maybe weeks, sometimes days. I've never heard of months in the mountains and by themselves. Usually I know that they always have like mentors as well as confidants and things of that nature and they learn how to seek for their own food. They learn also how to survive, basically to teach them how to be a man type of thing. And then I'm a Zulu. In my Zulu culture, we don't have that type of tradition or cultural practice because King Shaka Zulu abolished circumcision during his days when he was still here on earth simply because he felt that initiation or circumcision school 
took way too long and yet he had wars that he wanted to win and so he wanted all his warriors to be by his side training as well as fighting in the wars that he embarked upon he felt that if he sent his warriors to the mountains to get initiated that will take way too much time and it's also going to take way too much time for them to heal and therefore he just abolished the entire practice so that he has his soldiers by his side so in the zulu culture initiation was never restored to date however cedric Marke felt that this was barbaric and inhumane for a child to be put through something like that and he hated it and he was seriously pissed off he said so when Cedric Market dropped out of school, he went straight to Johannesburg to become a plumber. Like I said earlier on, the Bantu education taught black kids to become manual laborers. So plumbing was one of the causes that Bantu education taught black kids at school. So as most serial killers, Cedric Market was quite intelligent and he hated working for somebody else. So as a result, he decided to open his own plumbing company and work for himself and that's exactly what he did so when Cedric Marke was old enough he got himself a wife whom he had four children with his wife and the kids they lived in Limpopo province which is about a four or five hours drive away from Johannesburg so Cedric Marke loved his wife and children that when his business was starting to pick up he went to Limpopo province and brought them back to Johannesburg to live with him however Cedric Marke also had a girlfriend in Johannesburg when Cedric Marke brought his family to Johannesburg he took them to a suburb called La Rochelle so out of the blue Cedric Marke decided to take a u-turn but for the worst he started getting himself involved in a life of crime so i'm not quite sure what changed his mind it is highly possible that he may have met bad company who spoke about how easy it was to make easy money through crime and that's exactly what marcus decided to do which is quite disappointing for a person that intelligent so on the 28th of december 1996 a gentleman by the name of antonio alfonso was working at a cafe called Hill Gardens in Rosettenville. Cedric Marke walked into the cafe and he began to attack Antonio. Cedric Marke was bludgeoning Antonio on the head with a hammer. Antonio collapsed to the ground and Marke went straight to the cash register and he stole about 500 rand. Fortunately, Antonio Alfonso survived the hammer attack. So on the 31st of December 1996, Cedric Marquez welcomed the new year with proceeds that he had made from his criminal activities. On the 6th of January 1997, Cedric Marquez attacks a 78-year-old man with a hammer in his tailor shop. He blunges the 78-year-old man on the head, on the body and everywhere. The 78-year-old man's name was Kaji. Cedric Marke introduced himself as a plumber to Kaji and he told him that he needed two pairs of pants that he could use while he's working. Kaji being a tailor, he could tell the size of Cedric and therefore he went at the back and brought some pairs of pants to show him and he even gave him an opportunity to fit them. And when Moses fit them and then indeed they suited him well, he then took them off and then asked Kaji to bag the pants for him as he's going to purchase them. So as Cedric pretended to pay for the pants, that's when he whipped out a hammer and began to attack Kaji. Kaji fell to the ground and then he passed out. While he was passing, while he had passed out, Moses went into Kaji's cash register and stole the money that was there and some few items. Kaji was found by another customer lying on the floor in the pool of blood and he was rushed to the hospital. However, Kaji did also survive the attack, but he remains with the scars that will remind him of what happened to him on that fateful morning. So about two or three days later, Cedric Marke went to a butchery in Bezaden Hood Avenue in Troyville where he started to bludgeon a man by the name of Kenny Chang. When Chan hit the ground, Cedric Marke went straight to the cash register where he stole 500 rand. Fortunately, Kenny too survived the attack. 
On the 17th of January 1997, Cedric Marker went to Rocky Street in Dorenfontein. At about 10.30 a.m., he entered the shop of the Valley Brothers. A man was standing behind the counter when Cedric entered the shop and then he started asking the man some few questions about items of clothes that he wanted. The Valley Brothers were also tailors and they made very beautiful clothes. So that is when Cedric Marquez pulled out a pair of pants in his bag and showed it to the man in front of the counter and said, look, these pants are way too big on me. I want them to be alterated. Do you think you can do that job for me? The man on the other side of the counter said, yeah, sure, we can alter this for you and it will look great on you. Cedric Marquez then handed the pants over to the man and then he took a seat and waited while the man was busy altering his pants. So while the man was busy altering Cedric's pants, Cedric then pointed at a pair of shoes and said, I like those shoes, can I see them? The man got up from his seat and he reached out to the pair of shoes and handed them over to Cedric. He looked at them and said, you know what, I want to purchase them, but I can only pay in installments until I'm done, then I will take the shoes with me. The shop owner was like, great, there's no problem, you can lay by them. So to pay for the deposit for the shoes, he reached into his pocket and took out some amount of money and paid it to the valid brother and said, you know what, this is how much I can pay up until I'm done and then take my shoes with me. The valid brother was like, fine, that's okay. I'm happy with the business that you are bringing to us. So while this man was busy writing the receipt for Cedric, that is when Cedric pulled out a hammer. And then he showed it to the shop owner and said, hey, look here, my hammer is broken. Is it possible if you can fix it for me? The man was like, actually, I don't know how to fix hammers. However, there is a hardware store just down the road. They can fix it for you. And that's when Cedric said, OK, fine, let me go there and have it fixed. I will return just a little bit later. So after a while, Cedric Marke did return to the shop with his hammer fixed. And then he turned around and asked the Valley brother if he could please show him some underwear because he wants to purchase one. So when the man turned around and went into the shelves where he keeps the underwears, that is when Cedric Marquez came from behind and started to attack the man with a hammer. When this man fell down, Cedric Marquez then went into his pocket, took out a wallet and put it in his own pocket and then he went to the cash register and stole some money that was in there and he fled. This man suffered severe skull injuries and he also had a brain clot. However, he did survive the entire ordeal. On the 22nd of January 1997, Cedric Marquez went to Newtown Bree Street where he attacked a man by the name of Abdul Babula. Again, his modus operandi was to use a hammer on his victims. Immediately, the shop owner turns his back to get Cedric the item that he wants. That's when he ambushes them from the back and begins to bludgeon them with the hammer on the head. After attacking Abdul, he then went into his pockets and stole 600 rand from him. Abdul also survived the hammer attack. I guess the biggest shock factor for me is the fact that all these men that Cedric is attacking with a hammer on the head, they are elderly men. On the 23rd of January 1997, Cedric Marke walks into a shop in Van Villach, Johannesburg CBD, in a men's shop by the name of Patel. Guys, please do forgive me because most of the names here are a little bit difficult to pronounce and I don't want to butcher anybody's names. So if the name is a little bit easy for me to pronounce, then I will say it. If I can't, I will definitely not say that person's name. I'll either say the man or Mr. Somebody or whatever it is that I could make out of their names. Mr. Patel was busy in his shop doing some sewing when Cedric Marquez walked into his shop. Cedric Marquez did not ask any question this time. All he did, he went straight to Mr. Patel and began to bludgeon him with a hammer on the head. When Mr. Patel fell down to the ground, that's when Cedric went into his pockets and then stole his wallet and fled. Customers walked into Mr. Patel's shop and that's when they found him lying on the floor in a pool of blood and they called the ambulance. He was rushed to the hospital but upon arrival, Mr. Patel had died. 
This makes it Cedric Marquez's first murder case. On or about the 3rd of February 1997, Hassan Ahmad was working at a cash and carry in Fortsburg when Cedric Marquez walked into the shop. Uh, Ahmad did try to put up a fight against Cedric but unfortunately he was overpowered and then Cedric began to bludgeon him with a hammer on the head. He fell to the ground and Cedric went into his pocket and stole 200 rand. Fortunately, Hassan Ahmed also survived the attack. On the 26th of February 1997, Cedric Marker goes to Rocky Street in Yeovil where he enters a pawn shop, P-A-W-N pawn shop, where he attacks a man by the name of David Saka with a hammer on the head. He steals David's wallet, credit cards and other items in the pawn shop and he fled. Fortunately, David too survived the hammer attack. On the 27th of February, this time, Cedric Marke has an accomplice, walks into another shop in Van Villeck Street in Johannesburg CBD, where they rob a man by the name of Mr. Gopal. They beat him with a hammer and then when he fell to the ground, they took the money in the cash register and also went into his pocket and stole his wallet. However, Mr. Gopal did also survive the hammer attack, but he suffered a brain injury because he could not remember a thing that happened to him. All he remembers was he was working, next thing, blackout. I still believe that Cedric Marquez somewhere, somehow was told by someone that doing crime pays more than a regular job. It may be even possible that the guy that he's with is the one that told him about this and then Cedric Marquez being the ambitious guy that he is he thought hmm that's a great idea let me start robbing people and just harming them hurting them for their belongings and property like who does that so after a while Cedric Marquez got bored with basically bludgeoning tailor makers as well as shop owners he then decided well you know what maybe i need to move to another area and start committing a different crime this is when he went to Wemapan. so Wemapan is a well-known lake or area which has a recreational center and other things that couple that people love to go and do there the most popular activity in Wemapan was couples going there to spend some quality romantic time and basically look at the lake and then feed some dogs and other birds around that area so it was quite an attractive area for lovers to go to you can call it the lovers corner or the lovers whatever it's called in Wemapan, Cedric Markel changes his modus operandi so on the 27th of April 1997, Cedric Marquez would enter what would be called later the Wemapan Serial Murders. So when Cedric Marquez was busy walking about the Wemapan area, he comes across a couple by the name of Elijah Shachwayo and Eunice Ngosapanzi. The couple were sitting in a 58-year-old Toyota Cressida vehicle, which was parked overlooking the lake. Cedric Marquez approached the Toyota Cressida and without warning, he opened fire on Elijah, shot him twice in the head, dragged Eunice into a bush where he shot and killed her. I believe when he dragged her into the bush, he actually raped her. Then after he was done, he then shot and killed her. The police had a very difficult task to find Elijah's home. When they got to his door, his wife opened the door. Not only the police had to drop the bad news about his passing away, but also he had to tell the wife that he was killed while he was with another woman. So after killing Elijah and Eunice, he walked in the same area. He came across a woman. He pointed a gun at her and then he dragged her into the bush where he raped her. After raping her, he began to bludgeon her with a rock on the head until she died. Unfortunately, the woman was never identified to date. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think if you kill more than two people, you are now declared a serial killer. Am I right? Or maybe it's more than two? Or is it more than three? I'm not sure. But I think more than two makes you a serial killer. 
not only he was a serial killer but also a rapist so about a month after he had killed the three people cedric market decided to change his modus operandi this time he was targeting taxi drivers so basically he will go into a taxi and then he will make sure that he's the last person to get off the taxi so then he would instruct the taxi to drop him off at a certain area near Wemapan and when the driver stops then he would run to the driver's side of the taxi point a gun at them and then open fire on the 27th of May 1997 Cedric Marquez took a taxi and then he made sure that he was the last person to jump off he directed a taxi driver by the name of Sipondima and asked him to drop him at the Wemapan so the taxi driver pulled off and then Cedric came out of the came out of the taxi and then he went straight to the driver's side and he opened fire and he shot at the taxi driver several times. Miraculously, Sipondima did survive that attack. But Cedric Marke had stolen 300 rand from Sipondima after shooting him. In June of 1997, he took another taxi driven by Michael Mkize. When he got close to Wemapan, he asked to be dropped off. When the driver pulled over, Marke opened the, the passenger door and went straight to the driver's side and then he opened fire again several times. Again, miraculously, Michael Mkize also survived the attack. I kept thinking while I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute. South African taxi drivers are one of the most feared people by South Africans. And Cedric Marke has the balls to rob. Cedric Marke had the balls to attack them and rob them. I was like, whoa, this is something new to me because we are terrified of these guys. They can be quite dangerous. I'm not saying all of them are but they can be dangerous and south africans they know and toe the line when it comes to taxi drivers in this country so after feeling that he had accomplished something basically challenging taxi drivers shooting at them and robbing them cedric market decided to stop robbing the taxi drivers and then he moved back to his second modus operandi which was targeting couples at wemapan in July of 1997, a 49-year-old Rev Nguenya and 42-year-old Christina Mashiho were sitting on the grass in Wemapan admiring the scenery, particularly the lake, while they were busy spending quality time together when Cedric Marte approached the couple and without warning, Cedric Marte opened fire at Ralph, shooting him twice in the back of the head. Raf Nguenya died instantly and then he dragged Christina into a bush nearby where he raped her. After he finished attacking her, he then shot her dead. After killing Raf and Christina, Cedric Marke then moved to his fourth modus operandi. Cedric Marke thought it would be fun to open fire at random people walking down the streets. On the 16th of June 1997, which is a public holiday here in South Africa called Youth Day, Cedric Marke meets a woman by the name of Dora Jala who was jogging along the Soweto Highway near Crown Mines where he attacked her, he dragged her into the bush, raped her and then he shot her dead. On the 21st of June, a gentleman by the name of Santi was walking with two ladies when he met with Cedric Marke. Cedric Marke approached the three friends and then he started up a conversation. Just as they were busy having a conversation unprovoked, he whipped out his gun and started shooting at Santi, killing him instantly. The two ladies fled in different directions for their lives. Marke then decided to rob Santi of his ID book, his shoes, as well as other items on his body. On the 11th of July 1997, Cedric Marke decided, let me go back to my second modus operandi where he was killing couples. In Wemapan, he came across a man by the name of Jerry Naidu with his girlfriend, Charlotte Lovu. Sitting in Jerry's car in Wemapan, Cedric Marke approached the car and then he asked the couple inside the car if they could please help him with how 
with how to operate his cell phone. Now, in 1997, cell phones were starting to be a thing in South Africa. I remember seeing my first cell phone at the airport in 1996, and I thought it was such a cool thing. So Jerry, like a helpful guy that he was, he wind down the window to speak to Marke to help him on how to operate his cell phone. That is when Marke shot Jerry in the stomach as well as on the chest, killing him instantly. He then went into Jerry's pocket where he pulled out his wallet and other items on his body and stole them. Then he went into the passenger seat where he dragged Charlotte out of the vehicle, took her into the bush where he raped her. After he had raped Charlotte, he then robbed her of her leather jacket, her shoes and other items she had on her body. But something very strange he did. He then took Charlotte to the street and asked her to flag down a taxi. Indeed, a taxi did come and then Charlotte opened the door and when she got into the taxi, she shut the door on Marke and she screamed at the driver and told him speed off speed off speed off this man is a killer he killed my boyfriend and the taxi driver did not ask any questions he sped off leaving cedric marquez standing all by himself by the side of the road probably wondering what the hell did i just do the following day a 35 year old moses and his 26 year old girlfriend Dockers were sitting on the Wema Park lawn admiring the scenery as all the other couples have done previously and they were spending some quality romantic time together. When Cedric began to open fire at Moses, hitting him at the back of the head and he died instantly. He then stole Moses' wallet and dragged Dockers into a nearby bush where he came across another man that was in the bush basically just sitting there doing nothing. He asked the man to pin this woman down while he was busy raping her. The man complied. I think it was an accomplice that he was working with. Maybe the accomplice did not want to touch the woman, but Cedric decided, you know what, I'll do the job by myself. And he raped Dockers twice that day. After he was done raping Dockers, that is when he gave Dockers money for a taxi. So just before Dockers left, Cedric Marke looked at Dockers in the eyes and then he arranged for a date with her. So after Dockers was given the money for the taxi, she began to hurry away to the street where she would flag a taxi. That's when Cedric called her and, and asked her, are you going to be going to Moses' funeral on the weekend? You know, I keep thinking, who is worse between Ananias Mate, Moses Sitole and this moron? Yeah, ne? So with all the attacks that were happening in Wemapan, the police started to coordinate all these cases and basically bundle them into one so that they know exactly what trail to follow in order for them to catch this killer and rapist. The investigation was headed by Captain Pete Belfeld. Now, if you don't know who Pete Belfeld is, he is known to be South Africa's top cop. He is the same guy. If you've been following this channel for a while now, you will know that I did a case about the kidnap and murder of Lee Matthews. Pete Belfeld was the one that caught Lee Matthews' kidnapper and murderer. And he had a 99% solved rate. Unfortunately, Pete Belfeld did pass away in 2017. From cancer. So during this time of Cedric Marke, Pete Belfeld was on top of his game. He was basically at his prime time as a top cop in South Africa. So one of the things that Pete Belfeld noticed about the killings in Wemapan that it took place on the fri between Friday and Sunday. Of course, Cedric Marke knew that people did not go to Wemapan during the week because they were working. So from Friday to about Sunday, most couples usually go to Wemapan to unwind or just to have, or just to spend quality time and do what lovers do there. Cedric Marker came across a 26 year old Stanley with his girlfriend, Emily, in their car parked just overlooking the lake in Wemapan. This time he pulled out his gun and then he pointed at Stanley's head and he told them to follow him. He took them to the usual bush where he rapes the women 
and then he asked and he forced them to undress when they finished undressing he told them to have sex together he wants to watch them while the couple was busy having sex edward market decided to go into stanley's pants and then he pulled out his wallet his watch took his shoes and some of the items that he liked that stanley carried with him after they were done cedric market then told them to get dressed up and then he then took them to another nearby bush where stanley made an escape and ran for his life leaving emily behind unfortunately cedric market would rape emily twice that evening after he was done raping emily he then shot her fortunately emily survived the shooting but he has stolen her leather jacket and other items that she had on her on the 18th of july 1997 cedric market does the unthinkable he kills five people in one day his first two killings of the five killings he met a 25 year old samuel malema and his 25 year old girlfriend catherine the couple were walking along Main Reef Road in Lang Lachter. Cedric approached them with his gun drawn already. He proceeded to demand Samuel's wallet, but Samuel put up a fight. That is when Cedric shot Samuel three times in the head. He died instantly. So while he was busy robbing Samuel's body, he then shot Catherine on the knee, basically preventing her from running away. When he was done robbing Samuel's body, that is when he dragged Catherine into a nearby bush near the road where he raped her twice before running away. Then he proceeded to his next two victims of the five. He proceeded to Clermont where he came across a man by the name of David Duplessis and his girlfriend Sarah on Princess Avenue. Cedric then shot and killed David. He dragged Sarah into a bush where he raped her. After raping her, he shot her dead. Marcus stole David's shoes. His last two killings were also in Claremont, where he came across a 19-year-old Martin Stander and a 15-year-old Lani Van Vague. They decided to stop at the side of the road to take a smoke before dropping Lani at her, at her home. They were coming from a nightclub where Martin was a DJ. Marcus saw the two having a smoke on the side of the road. He simply opened fire on Martin, killing him instantly, and proceeded to rape the 15-year-old Lani, and then after raping her, he shot her dead. Lani will be his youngest victim. Marcus stole her clothes as well as jewelry she had on her. After about two weeks after killing the five people, Cedric Marquet then decided to get back at it again. He went to Boysen Reserve Road where he, met, where he met a couple by the name of Han and Doris. And this time he had another accomplice with him. The two men demanded money from Han and Doris. Unfortunately, the couple had no money with them. That is when Cedric began to rape and then bludgeoned the woman on the head with a rock until she died and then attacked Han until he also died. The two men then stole Doris's jeans that she was wearing. In August of 1997, Cedric decided to go back to his first MO, the hammer. Cedric Marker went to a shoe repair store that was owned by Luis Veltoni, who was busy repairing some shoes in his shop when Cedric Marker decided to bludgeon Louis with a hammer on the head. Louis fell to the ground and Marker robbed the man of all the cash that he had on him, but he survived the hammer attack. Okay, I know, I know, because I'm also like, why this man is not in jail yet? Shouldn't the police by now have figured it out who this perpetrator is and locked him up? But no, it's been eight months, actually more than eight months since Marker has started his attacking spree as well as his killing spree. And you're telling me the police at this point still have no clue who the perpetrator is? So that means more and more and more people are still going to get hurt and even killed as long as he's still a free man 
So on the 19th of August 1997, a cleaner of a store nearby went into Mr. Parsons' shop where he found him laying on a pool of blood in his shop. He had been attacked with a hammer on the face. About 10 a.m. that morning, Cedric Market had walked into Mr. Parsons' shop where he attacked him with a hammer. Fortunately, Mr. Parsons did survive the attack. On the 29th of August 1997, Cedric Market walked into KB Patel Taylor's in Rocky Street in Yeovil, where he attacked Mr. Patel with a hammer on the face. The tailor was then rushed to the hospital where he died. On the 14th of September in Pine Street in Fordsburg, a wholesaler, Abdul Karim, was attacked by a market with, an, with a hammer hitting him on the head as well as on the neck. He fell to the ground and that is when Cedric Marke robbed him of his wallet and other items on his, on his persons. Mr. Abdul Karim did survive the attack as well. On the 19th of September 1997, Cedric Marke attacks a 79-year-old man by the name of Hajivan Dyer, who was also a tailor. What's up with him and tailors? After attacking Daya, he then stole his wallet and other, and other valuables in his shop and he fled. He too survived the attack. On the 4th of October 1997, Mr. Mohammed Ibrahim was murdered by Mr. Marke in his shop in La Rochelle. Mohammed has sustained severe head injuries on the neck as well as on his body and then he succumbed to those injuries. He was found by a customer lying on the pool of blood in his shop. Marke, while Mohammed Ibrahim was busy dying, he went into the cash register and withdrew every rand he had in the cash register and fled. On the 14th of October 1997, Marke murders Mr. DeSanto Serrano in a Tedfontaine cafe called The Good Hope. He bludgeoned Mr. DeSantos with a hammer on the head until he died. Once again, Marke went into the cash register and robbed it. On the 18th of October, Marke then approaches a man by the name of Eduardo Gusta in a wholesale shop in Poison. Marke had asked Eduardo if he could give him a plastic bag. While Eduardo was bending to get him the plastic bag, that is when Marke took out the hammer and began to bludgeon Eduardo on the head. Eduardo fell on the ground. While he was on the ground, Marke proceeded to open the cash register where he took out 500 rand and then he went into Eduardo's pocket and stole 50 rand in the pocket. And that's when he ran away. Fortunately, Eduardo Gusta did survive the attack. Marke, the following day, he went to a 66-year-old man's shop and this time he had a female accomplice. When they got to his shop, he asked the tailor if he could please sell them a pair of underwear. While the old man was going to the shelves where he put the underwears, that is when Marke and the lady began to bludgeon the 66-year-old Mahesh and he fell to the ground. They robbed Mahesh of 500 rand. However, Mahesh did survive the attack. On the 4th of November, Cedric Marke kills yet another tailor. The tailor's employee was coming to work at 8 o'clock when she realized that the door to the shop was still closed. She peeped through the window and saw her boss lying in the pool of blood on the floor. And that is when she went and called the security guard who kicked the door down and there, the, and there he was laying on the floor dead in his own blood. They discovered that the cash register was also robbed. So with this killing of the last tailor, the Indian as well as the Muslim community were up in arms. They were complaining about the police not doing enough to investigate who is this person that was targeting that was targeting Indians who were tailors as well as Muslims who were shop owners. They wanted answers and they wanted answers now. Then the Indian community decided to go and report this entire situation to the Safety and Security Council 
which was headed by Jesse Duarte of the ANC. Jesse Duarte then took the file and handed it over to Pete Bellafeld and she wanted this to be investigated thoroughly and have the perpetrator caught as soon as possible. In the community meeting, Bellafeld did come and then he made a suggestion to the community. He then proposed that the police install surveillance cameras in all retail in all tailor shops as well as other shops around the areas of Johannesburg in the hope that they catch the killer. But the community were not satisfied with what Bellafeld was telling them. Instead of listening to what he was saying, they decided to go to the media where they spilled the beans about everything that has transpired for the past year and the police have done absolutely nothing to catch the perpetrator. Unfortunately, Pete Bellafeld's plan had to fall away because he knew that by now the perpetrator knows that the police are on his trail. Indeed, Cedric Marke caught on wind when he watched the news and realized that the police were investigating him. So he decided to change his MO and this time he decided to do house invasions, carrying a knife. He also knew that probably the police had started to investigate the Wemapan murders and so he stayed away from Wemapan. On the 2nd of November, Mr. Jesek Karras was stabbed to death by Cedric Marte after invading his house and then he stole his television as well as his VCR. On the 7th of November 1997, Arthur McIntyre was attacked in his home. He was bludgeoned to death with a hammer by Cedric Marke. Cedric Marke proceeded to steal his television, his VCR as well as his radio. He also stole Arthur's 38 caliber revolver. After killing Arthur, Cedric Marke then decided to basically become ballsy. He returned to his Hammer series because he realized that the police were not anywhere near the areas where he was where he was attacking tailors. He went to a shop by the name of Victoria's Fashion where he came across a Chinese couple, a Chen Kao as well as Chi Kao, where he hammered them both with a hammer and then unfortunately Chang died but Chi did survive the attack. He proceeded to steal their money and ran away. About a week later, after attacking the Chinese couple, he went into another tailor shop where he killed a man by the name of Taco with a hammer. On the 28th of November 1997, a man by the name of Gerald Laval was riding his bicycle in the Wemapan area where Marke shot him at the back several times and he died instantly. Marke proceeded to steal his bicycle and went and pawned it. On the 12th of December 1997, Cedric Marke comes across two women by the name of Tandindaba as well as Mini Ngabinde. They were sitting in the shack that they had built near Blue Dam at Homestead Park. Cedric had approached the two women pretending to be a policeman investigating stolen items that were brought into the informal settlement. He then proceeded to say that he's going to search the house. When he was done searching the house, he took the two women and asked them to follow him to his vehicle. As they were walking to his vehicle, he turned around and pointed the gun at Minnie's head and then he proceeded to rape Tandy several times. After he was done raping Tandy, that is when he shot Minnie and killed her instantly. On the same day, Cedric Marke broke into the house of Cyril Slattery in Terfontein. Marke bludgeoned Cyril in the head several times with a hammer until he died. He proceeded to steal his television after killing Cyril. About two days later, a 25-year-old Enoch Mgoma with his 24-year-old girlfriend Deliwe Ngokela were walking through the felt when they came across Cedric Marke. He pointed a gun at them and then he forced them to undress and have sex together while he watched. While they were busy having sex, he then fired a warning shot just to show them that he was carrying a real gun 
and also to instill fear in them. After he was done watching them have sex, he then robbed Enoch of all his belongings, and then he let Enoch go unharmed. On the 19th of December 1997, Cedric Marke comes across a man by the name of Bongani Ngama and Dombifuti Mzamelo. He wasted no time. He shot Bongani at the back of his head, killing him instantly. He then proceeded to kidnap Dombifuti and took her to Wemapan, where he raped her twice. And at this time, you would think the police will be there. Basically surveilling the area but no they're not there and that is why this man has the balls and the gall to go back to Wamapan and then comes with a woman from another area to rape her in the same bush that he always raped the other women and the police are not there okay I get it in 1997 South Africa three years prior had just entered democracy and the police force was still trying to scramble together a police force that was going to be working and these crimes were taking place i also know that th around the same time there was another serial murderer which i did cover last week moses Sitwale. but at this time he was already caught and being prosecuted in the high court but the police still had their hands full with just new other crimes that were taking place now including this one so i'm not sure if they were short of police or maybe they didn't know what to do i don't know remember south the death penalty in south africa was still active under the apartheid system but when South Africa went into democracy, the death penalty was considered or declared unconstitutional because it was inhumane and unusual and cruel punishment. So, I don't know. So, after Cedric Marke had raped Ndom Futi, he then made a dress up and then forced her to walk with him down the road where they came across two men. One, one of the men's name was Richmond. Unprovoked, Cedric Marquette drew his gun and shot at Richmond. However, Richmond did survive the shooting. Marquette then proceeded to take Ndomfuti to Faraday train station, where he raped her two more times, and then he let her go. But before letting her go, he told her to promise him that she will never identify him to the police. And before she left, he looked her dead in the eye and said to her, you are lucky that I didn't kill you. One of Belfell's MO, whenever he investigated a high profile case, he always went back to the crime scene several times before he would figure out maybe a different perspective or maybe look for things that they did not look for while they were there initially. So while he was busy doing his usual uh modus operandi in his investigations he came across a piece of tissue he took the piece of tissue and sent it to the lab for dna testing so this was in Wemapan, where he found this piece of tissue that is when belfeld went to all marquez rape survivors and basically interviewed them he wanted he wanted them to describe to him how the rapist looked like while he was interviewing them, he would ask them to also give him, uh, he would also ask them to give him samples of their DNA, either by saliva or drawing some blood. The survivors described Marke as a small, thin man. He was strong and aggressive. They said that after raping them, he would chase them, swearing at them in Afrikaans. Some women said he would even boast to them about the murders that he had committed. Belfeld then explained that at one point he and his female policewoman decided to go to Wemapan where they decided to park in a car and they, that overlooked the lake in the hope that in the hope that Cedric Marke will come and do what he always does with his other victims. However, when it got dark, he then called off the surveillance and then so that he could protect all the other policemen in case Cedric was watching. 
On or about the 21st of December 1997, Belfeld and his team came across what looked like would be a break for the investigation. A member of the public called Belfeld and his team and reported a suspicious man that was lurking around a local hotel. The man never booked a room in the hotel nor has he ever ate in the hotel, but he was always around. The caller further described the man that he did not look homeless. As a matter of fact, he looked neat and trustworthy but suspicious. When Bellafeld asked the caller to describe this man, that is when the caller described him as small built, neatly dressed, wearing a green pants with grey top with a face that was fading. The caller further said to Bellafeld that he suspected that the man was a boyfriend to a lady by the name of Angelina, who stayed at the hotel. Angelina had worked for a dog parlor not far from the hotel. On the 23rd of December 1997, Belfeld and his team decided to surveillance Angelina. At about 11 a.m., Angelina boarded a taxi that was headed to Town. Near the railway station, Angelina got off the taxi and waited on the corner of Page and Posh Street in Town. Cedric Marke was finally taken into custody. However, Cedric Marke refused to talk. Anyway, that's his right. You have the right to remain silent. Belfeld said Marke looked trustworthy. He is a man that you could swear he would not hurt a fly. You could even hire him if he wanted a job from you. That's how trustworthy he looked. At the police station, while they were busy trying to interview Marke, they also drew some blood samples from him and they sent the blood samples straight to the DNA lab, which worked around the clock even on Christmas Day, trying to establish the DNA of this man, linking them against all the other items that they had collected at Wemapan. And voila, it matched. Cedric Marke is the Wemapan serial killer and rapist. So Belfeld is celebrating the catching of the Wemapan serial killer. He was still worried about the Hammerman that was busy terrorizing tailors and the Indian and Muslim community around Johannesburg. However, Cedric Marke was not happy with his arrest. Apparently, he started screaming. He screamed for hours until the police at the holding cells started calling Belfeld to come over and calm his prisoner. Belfeld wasted no time and went to the holding cells where he tried to calm Cedric down. Cedric had been using his feces and throwing them at the police. He did not want to talk. He was just screaming through and through. Marke continued to act like a madman. He was throwing everything he could find in his cell around. Pete Belfeld tried all kinds of tactics to try and calm Cedric down. He even offered him a cigarette. Cedric took the cigarette from Belfeld, looked at him and said, man, I don't smoke. But he took the cigarette and put it on his ear. Then he took it out again, then crushed it and he threw it at Belfeld and told him, I said, I don't smoke. In the background, other policemen were busy investigating or trying to check who could calm Marke down. And they discovered that Marke was very close to his mother. This is the only person that Marke would listen to. They took the information to Belfeld and that's when Belfeld used the information to tell Marke that if he behaved and came down, he will allow his mother to visit him. And the plan worked. He further promised Marke that he will have visitation rights with his mother once he is in prison. This was a way of Belafel to try and establish a trust between him and Cedric Marke. The next day, Belafel then confronted Marke with DNA evidence. That is when Cedric started to smile and admitted to being the Wemapan serial killer and rapist. Marke then decided to take the police 
to all of his heinous crime scenes. Basically, he was showing them exactly what he was doing there, how he was doing his crimes. Basically, he would go to couples and then he would shoot the man, take the woman, rape her in that bush nearby. And then he would proceed and he just kept doing that over and over and over again. He then, when he heard that he was being investigated, he then decided to go and do house invasions where he murdered two people during that cause of the, that time. And then Bill felt it then said, okay, let's go. Where are all the things that you stole from these houses that you were invading? And that's when he said they are with his mother in Limpopo. Bellefeld then felt that they needed to go and visit his mother so that they can find more information about, about Cedric Marquez. They all drove to Cedric Marquez's mother with Cedric shackled and cuffed from head to toe. Cedric's mother, when, he, when she saw her son in shackles and handcuffed, she was heartbroken. She could not believe what she was witnessing. She just did not understand why her son had killed all those people and indeed all the stolen items were at his mother's house the police then collected all the stolen goods and then they let and they told marcus mother that all these things that are in your house they were not bought by by Marke, but he stole them and he even murdered some people for them cedric's mother dropped her head and shook it in absolute disbelief and disappointment that is when Bellfeld gave Cedric Marquez and his mother some time to talk while Bellfeld was in Limpopo he also found out that Cedric Marquez's mother was the second wife to his father and then when he died the fam the first wife as well as uh, as well as her husband's family did not like the second wife and they were they mistreated her and made sure that she inherited nothing from from Cedric's father's death. So they were pushed into abject poverty. They were destitute. And as a result, that angered Cedric. Cedric was so angry, but the person that he was angry at was his father for leaving them in the situation that they have found themselves in abject poverty sometimes they would even go to bed hungry he kept saying i hate my father i hate my father on the way back to johannesburg brixton to be precise Marke started opening up the first thing that he told them was about the gun that he used in killing all these people he said he could take them where the gun where he had hidden the gun so on the way back to the holding cell they went and route to the place where he had hidden the gun it was an abandoned mine shaft cedric marke was so fast even in shackles he was going straight to where the gun was at Belfeld realized that marke was about to kneel down and and retrieve the gun and then he knew without a doubt that once marke gets hold of that gun they were all dead. So Belfeld ran after Marke and then pushed him and Marke fell on the side. That's when Belfeld retrieved the murder weapon. Belfeld still wanted to know more information about Cedric Marke's background. He even went as far as going to all of his former employers who said Cedric Marke was a very trustworthy and hardworking employee. They had good things to say about Cedric. It turns out one of Cedric's half-brothers was a police sergeant who went to Belfeld with 500 rand bribed and asked Belfeld to help his brother out. I did not find out if Belfeld opened a case of bribery against Cedric's brother, but I think he did. But I'm not sure if that was an established crime back in 1997. I just could not find anything about that unfortunately belfeld then went to cedric marquez's wife to interview her basically to find out about the type of person cedric was that is that is when cedric marquez's wife began to confess she basically told belfeld that she had been unfaithful to cedric in the early days of their marriage remember some of his rape survivors said marquez would chase after them swearing at them basically demeaning them 
The police then search Marquez's room that he rented with his wife and children. And the wife could not believe that Cedric Marquez, her husband, was the Wemapan serial killer. It dawned on her that probably the reason why he was murdering people there was because of her affairs that she was having at the Wemapan. At this time, Pete Belfeld still had no idea that the Hammerman and the Wemapan serial murderer were one and the same person. However, while Belfeld was busy digging to find more information about Cedric Market, he came across a pawn shop where he, while he was digging for things at Cedric's house, he found a receipt with a name of Patrick Mukwena. This Patrick Mukwena rang a bell to Belfeld. And then he thought, let me go and check the pawn shop. When he got to the pawn shop, he realized that uh, Cedric Marquez had sold Gerald's bike to a pawn shop. And the pawn shop basically gave him a, uh, a receipt with the name of Patrick Mukwena on it. That is when it clicked on Belfeld that, oh my goodness, I have both the Wemapan serial killer as well as the hammer man. He could not believe his eyes and the realization that, wait a minute, but he needed to confirm this because he wanted to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Pete Belfeld then corrected the terminology of Cedric Marke being a serial killer, but instead he said he was a super killer. So one of the last questions that Pete Belfeld asked Marke was about the tailors. He wanted to know what was his obsession with tailors. And you would not believe his answer. People, he said, the reason why he was killing tailors is because one of the tailors had messed up his shirt and the tailor did not apologize after Cedric had brought it to his attention that you destroyed my shirt. But the tailor simply dismissed him with absolute disrespect. That is when he decided that tailors must die because he loves clothes. He loves to look neat and he loved to look at himself in a mirror and see a handsome gentleman, a narcissist on top of that. So at the end of the day, Cedric Marke then admitted to Belfeld that indeed he is the hammer man. He used hammer and he did indeed attack all the people that were put before him. He admitted to all of those attacks, including the murders. He was even surprised that some of these people actually survived the attack because he went for them. He was bludgeoning them, making sure that he would hear that they have died. But he was very surprised that the majority of them actually survived. Bell felt when he was interviewing Cedric Marquez, he realized that this man was not talking out of guilt or remorse. He was simply boasting about all the killings and the bludgeoning he was doing with his hammer and for so long without getting caught. So after Belfeld had taken all of his investigations and put all the pieces together, the murders at Wemapan as well as the hammer attacks on tailors as well as wholesalers, it all came together that Cedric Marquez was going to be facing 133 charges in total. In April of 1997, Cedric Marquez was having his day in court because his trial began. The trial lasted 355 days with all of his rape survivors testifying in court. The survivors that sustained head injuries and brain damage were given leading questions. Basically, all they were asked, let me read it to you. The survivors that sustained brain injuries were required to state their name, when and where they had been attacked, and whether they had been struck behind the left or right ear with a hammer. So after all it was said and done, on the 16th of March year 2000, Cedric Marke was found guilty. Okay, let me read this one because it's pretty lengthy. 
On the 16th of March 2000, Cedric Mata was found guilty of 27 counts of murder, 26 counts of attempted murder, 41 counts of robbery with aggravated circumstances, 1 count of attempted robbery, 14 counts of rape, 1 count of assault with grievous bodily harm, 3 counts of illegal possession of firearm and 1 count of illegal possession of ammunition for the single bullet that was found in his pocket. Wow. Cedric Marke was sentenced to 1,885 years in prison plus 3 months for the bullet that was found in his pocket. Pete Belfeld described Cedric Marke as the worst of the worst. And there I thought it was Moses Sitole, who got, I think, 2,410 years in prison. But anyways, they both will be spending thousands of years imprisonment. And guess what? Cedric Marke, as well as Moses Sitole, are in the same CMEX prison in Pretoria, serving the thousands of years imprisonment. Well, that is it, guys, with the case of Cedric Marke, another South Africa's worst serial killer, also known as the Wemapan serial killer. Thank you so much for watching my video. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to my channel if you have not subscribed. Don't forget to click the bell notification so that you do not miss out on any of my new true crime videos. And I would also love to hear from you by leaving a comment down below and tell me what you think of Cedric Marke. And I will definitely see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.